um, the response may be explained by um, individually by each one of say 10 mm -hmm. explanatories. Um, so how do you combine those individual you know one factor models into a statement you know that's in, that uh, involves all the 10 explanatories? Well, uh, I have the my mic. Uh, basically, uh, that's what I was trying to explain. I w the, w the way I answer your question, I don't have one way to do it. Uh -huh. It depends on the ultimate question I have. So whether you are measuring a risk, whether you are building a portfolio, whether you are trying to assess a given uh, stress testing uh, question, mm -hmm. I will give you different answers to all those questions. I'm just saying that the basis of having that book where every single page is a single factor model mm -hmm. is more useful than having a list of factor loadings on a, on a... I completely agree. I mean, I think sort of trying to chop it, chop the dimension down is, is a really smart way to go about it. But the, if, if the question, for instance, is how far can it go mm -hmm. you to get a risk measure, mm -hmm. I told you, so you, you look at, at the risk that you get from every single phone and you just simply select the good risk factors. You just discard something like 90% of the factors are just <coughs> discarded. You just get about 10% of them, but sometimes it's more than that, especially when the market becomes agitated. Mm -hmm. Factors become very correlated between one another. So if one is relevant, another is relevant as well. Mm -hmm. And if they are, actually it's a good crisis prediction. The number of factors that are relevant is a good crisis prediction because what happens before crisis is that precisely uh, uh, the, 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 the factors, uh, you'll get more explanations. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is precisely because you get the source and because you get a very long possible history of the risk factors, then you can map many past crises and then you get a better picture of the possible risk. So this is just an example. Very good. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I turn to Lane? I mean, maybe you could put could you put up your talk again? Because I'd, I'd like to look at, uh, refer to one of the slides. Um, uh, it was sort of around about slide eight, I think, or somewhere around about there. It's a long way back. Uh, where you were looking at the, um, no, quite a long way back. It was where you were looking at the uh, stochastic vol model um, and a, uh, Um, one page down, sorry. Uh, on one more. Uh, where, no, uh, back a bit. <laughs> um, where you have the where you have the price of of the thing in terms of an expectation <coughs> under star, where W star was uh, W T minus that that uh, is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Nineteen. So nineteen. So so. I mean, if we get if if we. So, so I, I look at 19 and 20, and I think, well, um, actually, the price is being given in 19. It's an expectation under the measure P star, and in the measure P star, W star is a Brownian motion. So the, 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 the price there is just a function of the Brownian motion um, W star, and it doesn't depend on lambda. So um, it, it seems to me like the price that you get from 19 simply can't depend on lambda. Um, uh, uh, you know, provided all the kind of Cameron Martin um, steps that you're taking are, are, are okay, um, you know, that's the, the, the price you've got there is simply an expectation of a functional of a Brownian motion, and all dependence on lambda has been removed. So I think I think the problem is arising because actually um, the Cameron I, Martin I can steps interrupt at some point. Yeah. I'm sorry, W star is a, is, is a Brownian motion in P star. In P star, it is a brand new motion. Yeah, but the, if I can just intervene, because I can see where you're coming from, because this is exactly the sort of consideration that led us to develop the model in the first place. And this is just the sort of point which I think was kind of missed uh, uh, in the past. And the, uh, the thing is that it all depends on what your choice of, uh, of, of, of sigma is. Now, a little bit later on, uh, we simply assert that the model is that sigma is uh, some function of the P Brownian motion. Uh, and, and then if you rewrite it, uh, if you rewrite sigma as a function of W star, then uh, that brings the, uh, the parameter lambda in. 
So you can proceed to do your valuation using Cameron Martin and so on and so forth, but then you're left with this residual but, uh, but, lambda. But, but the problem is with your particular choice of, um, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the risk premium, it was linear in W, wasn't it? So you're going to end up in, this, in the stochastic integral in 20, you're going to end up with something of the form integral of W star dW star. So you're going to get a W star squared, and then the exponential of a squared, you know, integrating by parts, and, and an expectation, you, the exponential of WT squared is not integrable. So you're looking at a situation there where you've got um, something which is a local martingale, but not a martingale. And I, I, I think... I think there's, you know, if, if you're, if the, as I say, if all of the Cameron Martin calculations, all of the arguments of the Cameron Martin uh, go through correctly, then 19 says the price can't depend on lambda. So my, what I conclude from that is that there's some, there's some hole in the, in the, in the Cameron Martin analysis, and that somewhere a local martingale fails to be a martingale, and I, I, I think that's that, that must be what's happening. Yeah. Well, it, in fact, that. Uh, what you suggest is is not a problem because uh, one can uh, one can take sigma to be any bounded function of uh, of w, and then you transform to uh, the risk neutral measure, and then it becomes some bounded function of w star minus lambda t, and you can do the calculation, uh, and then lambda will still appear uh, in the final result for the option price. Sigma is a stochastic volatility that depends on the Brownian before you put the star. And therefore, when you change measure, the stochastic volatility is, you know, there's some weird transform that happens on the stochastic volatility. It's not a question of integrability. It's a question that there's an implicit dependence on the shift uh, due to the fact that th the way he parametrized stochastic vol. Yes, no, Marco is correct once. Yeah. He's usually correct. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe you can ask a question to Raphael. One more. Can you describe the, um, the set of model of X1, X2, Xm such that they have the right projection? Um, Can you describe all the models phi of x1, x2, xn, such that... Okay, well, here, here is the... The conditional expectations are yeah, satisfied. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether I'm correctly answering your question because uh, I'm not sure of exactly what you want to know. But basically, uh, the, 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 the theorem with Shani is the following. Given... Uh, let me just... Go back to that slide here. That's the two okay. Oops. No. Where is it? I'm just trying to. Yeah, the other one. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the question is, pick a, a random variable. I mean, or yeah, suppose you take a random variable y, and you on the one hand you explain it with n factors, so you get this function, which is a conditional expectation of y with respect to x1, xn jointly. And then you do that variable, I mean one by one variable. So you get the uh, y explained by x1, so the conditional expectation of y with respect to x1, then the conditional expectation y with respect to x2, etc. And try to reverse the question. So you are given those conditional expectations respect to x1, respect to x2, etc. And the question is, does there exist a function of x1, xn that has a property that is going to... Obviously, uh, 
because you know you have the transition of conditional expectation, the conditional expectation of conditional expectation with respect to x1, x1, with respect to one of the xi is the phi i. So you, it's just a matter of existing of the fun, of a global function phi of n variables that matches with the input that you are giving yourself. Mm -hmm. And the answer is for the, the, the first obvious uh, necessity is that they all have the same expectation because the global expectation is the same. So assume this is the, the, the base or you assume that all expectation are zero so that you don't have any questions in here. Once you have that, the question is, does there exist a function of n variable that projects onto all the marginals? And the answer is positive in L2 provided you have this, uh, uh, this uh, ellipticity condition, which is in here, let me. Uh, uh, OK, let me get the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the ellipticity condition ensures that uh, the, there is a solution. And on top of that, there is one solution, which is a sum of nonlinear functions of individual variables. It's not, so typically if you have x1, x2, you will get a nonlinear function of x1 plus a nonlinear function of x2, but you will mix terms like x1 times x2. For the good reason that such a term has zero marginals. It's in the kernel of the problem. It's a linear problem, so you just need to check that. The, the, it's a linear dependence. So it's a linear problem, and so it's an inverse problem, you get a solution. So I give, you, I give you an intuition of that condition by the fact that this condition precisely usually is not satisfied. Okay. I tell you in what case this condition is not satisfied, which on top of that, it's like always you know, in finance. Not only you have a technical condition, most of the time the technical condition is not satisfied. A typical fat tail, how does that happen? Is that you have a common risk factor to many things. You have a portfolio of stocks. And suppose that each stock is divided between systematic risk and idiosyncratic. And very often, so you have fat tails in both. But suppose that the fat tail on one side at least uh, is the same for, uh, uh, on, the idiosync on the systematic risk and that the idiosyncratic risk is, has lesser tails than the systematic risk. What happens in, in that case is that basically you don't have the ellipticity condition because there is one particular direction which is not along one of the axes of, the, of, your, of your model. Mm -hmm. It's looked not along one of the coordinates uh, that, has, that bears more risk than the others. And you can find out that's a typical case where this ellipticity condition is violated. No, 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 no. It, you have to have a constant that works for any L2 function. The C does not depend on the phase. No, 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 no. Typically, no, no. Typically, if you take, if the xi are independent, this is satisfied. If you have a Gaussian copula, this is satisfied. But it's sufficient condition. It's a sufficient condition. Not necessary. Yeah, I mean exactly. I mean the c can be can be one percent. I don't care. It has to be positive, <laughs> but it has not to depend on the phase. It's a, it's a property of the set of random variables. But is it easy to verify in practice? Essentially, yeah, you can in practice verify it. It's, 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 it's pretty, I mean, the way to verify it is to look at the, at the covariance matrix, not only of the xi, but nonlinear versions of xi, because these are, you know, the, and it's the condition ratio of that matrix. So again, you know, it's uh, because the way you have, you have to invert the matrix. It's essentially like a, a one of these uh, almost in the philosophy of those, uh, those problems of uh, when do you have a fully transformed or when can you solve a moment problem? That, that's an inverse problem. That's absolutely. That's, it's very similar to any inverse problem. I can tell you another way to see it. What you have to invert is a matrix of nonlinear versions. So you. Each phi, which is a nonlinear function, can be seen, let's say, a polynomial. So you get, uh, you know, x, x squared, etc. 
well, it's better, to, you were talking about Fourier transform, it's better to use, you know, some uh, an odd orthogonal set of polynomials or cosines and sines, whatever. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, something that oscillates. Now, it's a condition ratio of it. It's more than positive definite. It's condition ratio of it. You need to control the condition ratio. So what happens typically is that suppose you take two variables that are uncorrelated, except when you have a big tail. One way to say that is that the two variables are not so much correlated, but puts on the variable are very correlated. You see? So you get some nonlinear function of, the x, of x1 and x2 are highly correlated, even though x1 and x2 are not so much correlated. And in that case, that destroys the condition ratio of the... And because this is very often the case, because precisely when you have this tail concentration effect that in a crisis everything becomes correlated, this typically this condition, you know, looks like very technical and in reality is not, it's not so well satisfied. Yeah, a typical non-Gaussian copula will violate that condition. A T copula will probably violate that condition. I'm not sure. But I think we need to stop. <laughs> I see some sign. Um, thank you very much. Maybe we can thank again Lane and uh, Raphael for their talk and discussion. Lane.